itself, I want to talk a little bit about just sort of a uh, more philosophical approach of what, what it is we're trying to do when we develop a card, why Mazda's drive the way they do, because that feeds directly into <clears throat> what we're trying to do with this all-wheel drive system and, and why it's designed the way it is. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a, I'm going to do a, a short Japanese lesson here, just, just two phrases. Uh, Hashira Yorokobi is, a, is a, a slogan that we use a lot um, that very poorly translates into the, the, the fun to drive or joy of driving or something like that. The more accurate uh, uh, translation is this rather cumbersome exhilaration, liberation felt from being moved. It, there's a difference between just the, the joy of driving, which people in this room all obviously understand, but you know, not how everybody on the road does. Um, <clears throat> this is a more broad uh, kind of uh, concept. Mm -hmm. Everybody, as a homo sapien, can appreciate getting into a machine and controlling it and being able to do way more than your body should be able to do. Your brain is programmed to be able to, to have a performance envelope that's built around what your body can do. And if you can get into this machine and suddenly ha you know, have all this mobility and all this dynamic range, that's a fundamentally joyful thing. Uh, and so that's sort of recognizing that that exists and trying to make the cards kind of bring out that joy uh, is, is sort of what drives everything we do in, in vehicle development. Um, if you think about um, that little the, the part of your brain that's excited about being able to do more than you should, uh, there's another part of your brain that's equally terrified by exactly the same thing. Uh, you should not be going this fast, you're going to hit a tree and die. Uh, and so what we're, we're constantly trying to do is make, make the car sort of activate that joyful part of your brain and never get the nervous part of your brain any, anything to be worried about. Um, in the, the sort of dynamic uh, areas of the, the, the phrase we use is Jimba Yitai, which I'm sure you've all heard because we've been yapping about it for 25 years. But this is a concept, uh, the, the phrase comes from old Japanese horse archery where they're riding on a horse and shooting a bow and arrow. And this takes a real coordination between the horse and, and the rider to be able to know exactly what the horse is going to do so they know exactly when they can release the arrow and actually hit a target as they go by. Um, since none of us ride horses, it's not that meaningful to you, but it, it, Basically what this is talking about is having the car feel like it's an extension of your body so that the way it behaves is so completely intuitive uh, that you never have any subconscious doubt about what it's going to do. It's that, little, that little fear corner of your brain never, never gets activated. And so we focus on a lot of really little details. Instead of these you know, big performance numbers and these numerical targets, we're focusing on a very precise feel and, and, and making sure that the car communicates back to the driver uh, in a very intuitive way. So we do a lot of uh, sort of study of what is intuitive to humans, what, what, how can a car communicate to, to a person so that they understand what's happening. Um, if you think about when a car is first entering a corner, this is one of the trickiest things that we try to do is make a car turn in properly. Um, because you're going from a steady state condition where you pretty much know what's going on in the car. And in the middle of a corner, you, you're in a pretty much steady state condition and you know, you know how much steering is going to do what. But that transition phase, when you first start to turn the wheel, there's a little bit of delay before the car starts to respond. That's the place where that paranoid part of your brain is going to pop and go, up and go, oh my god, nothing's happening yet. right? Um, and so we really work on making the car communicate through that first little millimeter of, of steering motion to, to, to kind of reassure you and let you know what it's going to do so you turn at the right amount to go exactly where you want to go. Um, so that finally brings me into the all-wheel drive. Because what we're trying to do with our all-wheel drive system is simply take that same precise driving feel that we've got on dry pavement and expand where we, can, where we can feel that. We want to be able to hit a puddle in the middle of a corner and have the car continue to do exactly what you want and not have that little paranoid uh, you know, voice in the back of your head. When we're on snow, we want to be able to, to have it feel just as precise and controllable as it is on pavement, um, not have it like, kind of lose grip for a second and then have the elbow drive kind of come in and claw it back. Uh, if we've done that, we've already lost the battle of having the car feel intuitive. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, we want the system to be almost, uh, ideally we'd like it to have no fuel economy penalty at all. Uh, at the moment, we're, you know, we want it to have the penalty be as small as possible to the point where it's not really a purchase consideration, where you can just, if you, if you want the security of all-wheel drive, you can, you can buy it and not have to worry about the, the impact on fuel economy. Um, <clears throat> before I go into how our system works, I think it's important to back up uh, and get a basic understanding of all-wheel drive systems in general. Um, there's basically two different kinds of all-wheel drive on the market. There's full-time all-wheel drive, 
which uh, has a center differential. So out of the transmission, uh, the drive will go into a differential that sends power to both ends of the car, uh, usually equally. Um, and that center differential allows those wheels to go slightly different speeds if they need to. Um, the, most systems on the road are on-demand systems, so they primarily drive usually the front wheels. Uh, and then the drive shaft has to come off the final drive to the rear wheels and is disconnected. And there's a clutch that you can use to, to connect the rear wheels when you need it. Um, so full-time all-wheel drive systems have the advantage, like I said, of being able to drive both wheels while they're going different speeds. Um, the disadvantage is that you're losing a lot, a lot of energy uh, putting torque through both of those uh, drive lines. Uh, so the fuel economy impact is really big. Um, and also, packaging a, a full-time four-wheel drive system efficiently really requires a longitudinal engine layout. So <laughs> companies that like fully commit to all-wheel drive, like Audi and Subaru, will lay out their cars in that way. But that, that layout, if that was the best layout for a car, everybody would lay them out that way. It's actually a really nose-heavy. There's a lot of compromises to it. And so you have to compromise the car overall in order to get this kind of all-wheel drive system. Um, <coughs> On-demand systems, we have better fuel economy because we're not loading those, uh, that rear drive line most of the time, uh, and a package is better. The, the disadvantages traditionally uh, have been this sort of uh, this response delay. So the, the systems will tend to be reactive. They wait until the front tires spin, and then they'll feed some, some power to the rear. That's how they know uh, not to waste uh, energy driving the rear wheels when it's not needed. Um, <coughs> of course, that immediately fails at our goal of not having that moment to, uh, of, of insecurity and not knowing what the car is going to do. Um, and because we're connecting the front and rear wheels rigidly, when we, when we lock into full four-wheel drive, the front and rear wheels are going exactly the same speed. So as you try to go around the corner, the rear wheels have to go a little bit slower than the fronts, and the system will, will kind of bind up. So to avoid binding up, they'll, they'll tend to loosen up in some conditions and, and that's not necessarily have uh, the, the optimal torque split because they're trying to avoid this binding problem. So these are, these are the areas we really wanted to figure out how to overcome um, while holding on to the advantages of an on-demand system. So what we really needed to do is figure out how to make the, the all-wheel drive system intelligent enough that it understands the conditions that you're driving in uh, so that it can, uh, it can get ahead of the curve and instead of waiting for the tires to slip, it can anticipate when they're going to slip redirect power to the rear wheels, take a load off the front, and prevent the slip in the first place. If we can do that, then we never have that, that loss of control that, that sort of breaks that, that, uh, that confidence. So it's, instead of a reactive system, we're calling this a predictive system. It's predicting when it's going to, uh, um, <coughs> when it's going to need drive. <sighs> Talking of this elevation is really hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so figuring out exactly when the tires are going to slip is very tricky because you have to know the conditions on the surface that you're driving over at that instant. And of course, you're constantly driving over lots of different surfaces that are changing all the time. Um, so what we figured out is that we have so much data flying around in the car for other, other systems that if we read that data intelligently, we can interpret what the, the, the surface conditions are very accurately without actually having to add any more systems to the car. So we've got 27 channels of data from other parts of the car that were already there that we feed into our all-wheel drive system to figure out what it needs to do. Um, some examples of, of, of this data, the outside temperature gauge that's, that's on the dash that, that tells us that it's minus six degrees out this morning, my God. <laughs> um, the all-wheel drive system knows that and knows, hey, it's pretty good odds that it's gonna be slippery. Uh, so that's sort of gonna bias it toward, toward you know, being a little more locked up. Um, we know if, it, if it's raining, because if it's raining, you turn on the wipers, right? So uh, that's a pretty good indicator. Um, we know for an, on an incline, incline makes it a lot more likely you're going to spin those front tires because you're transferring weight off of them. Um, we have a G sensor for the stability control system. Well, if you're seeing positive G and you're not moving, that means you're on a hill. So uh, we can see that. Um, we can see what the driver is doing to the car before it actually happens. So they step on the gas. Um, the computer knows you stepped on the gas and has to do something about it to, to, to make power. So we take that signal and we know, we know the torque is coming before it hits. Um, we know the brake fluid pressure, we know that you're on the brakes, we know what you're doing with the steering. We can also, in, in, in addition to these things that sort of hint at what the conditions might be, we can directly read the, the, the surface conditions through the steering uh, and, and through the individual, individual wheel speeds. So the steering thing is, is, is interesting because 
We have an electric power steering system that has a torque sensor and a steering angle sensor. And you know if you're going around a corner and you hit a puddle, you can feel that when the steering gets light, right? We can feel that much more precisely at much higher resolution by you know, reading constantly. Anytime you're steering, how much effort is it taking to, to make this amount of cornering? Uh, and that'll tell us exactly what the surface is like. So this is a really powerful tool because reading the surface through steering means we don't only have to, uh, we're not limited to using the all-wheel drive system when we're on throttle. We can use it off throttle. So if you're coasting downhill around the corner and hit a slippery spot, actually uh, engaging the clutch that connects the front and rear wheels uh, can actually stabilize the car even when, you, even when you're not at risk of spinning the tires. It's just redistributing some of the load on the tires and giving you a little bit more cornering grip. Uh, so we can use the system even off throttle. Um, now watching, when we're not steering, watching the wheel speed sensors individually, we can, we can look at how much the front tires are outrunning the rear tires. Um, this, this is a very interesting thing that we figured out because um, our goal here is not necessarily to, to lock them together to go back to the same speed all the time. We want to find the optimum grip level, which is the optimum amount of slip between the front and rear tires. Uh, and figuring out what that is um, meant kind of going back to our original plan here of trying to get inside the driver's head and make them confident. So the first thing we had to do is figure out, well, we don't want the driver to ever notice any wheel slip. So we first we had to figure out, well, what, what do people actually notice? We put some cars on the snow and had a bunch of people drive them and, and tell us when they noticed wheel slip. And we <coughs> charted that out and compared it to when we can recognize wheel slip with the computer. Um, what you're looking at here is some actual data from, from that test. Uh, the amount of tire slip is measured in, in the difference between the front wheel speed and the rear wheel speed. Um, and the tire torque is how much torque we're actually able to put down to the ground. And you notice as the, the front tire is slipping more and more, we're actually getting more grip. Uh, the, the maximum grip actually has a, a fair amount of slippage. But once, uh, <coughs> once the amount of drive force that we're getting starts going down while the wheel speed is going up, that's when people notice that the tire is slipping. So what we try to do is always control that front tire slip in this area where, where we can see it with the computer and we can manage to get the mo maximum grip out of those front tires, <coughs> but the driver can't feel it. So that's, doing that takes a very fast precise control. Um, this is why we're, we're monitoring things 200 times a second and trying to control the, the torque split 200 times per second so that uh, the tire never kind of breaks. Once the tire kind of breaks traction, it's, it's much harder to get it back. So we have to keep it right in that zone very precisely. Um, so now we have a computer being very smart about what we want, actually making it happen and getting it to the wheels at 200 times per second is the next challenge. Um, all on-demand four-wheel drive systems are laid out fundamentally the same. Ours is no different. Um, we're taking a drive off of the off of the, the front diff, driving the drive shaft all the time, and then this is the this is the rear differential here exploded on this bench. And at the front of the rear diff is this uh, uh, we call that active torque transfer coupling. It's a multi-plate clutch um, that we can control how much it slips and how much it connects to the front and rear wheels. Um, this clutch is very fast and very precise. Um, there are different kinds of multi-plate clutches. Some of them are hydraulically actuated. Some of them are viscous couplings, which are really slow and delayed. Um, the way this works is there's actually two sets of clutches in it. We've got an electromagnet here right, with this, with this wire is coming into it. And you can see how tiny the wire is. It only takes about three amps to lock this thing up. Um, this pulls on this first set of clutches that just spins this armature in the middle. And when this thing spins, it's connected to the main clutch through this little ball and ramp arrangement. And what that is, it's like a mechanical amplifier. So a little bit of grip on this clutch will start running this ball up these ramps, and that pushes on the, on the uh, main clutch really hard. Uh, and this, how much it rolls up is determined by how much torque we put in. So we just put a little bit of locking in, and the torque of the engine actually loads the clutches and, and, and transfers the torque. Um, I don't really need to know how that works that precisely. The point is it, it's very fast and very precise and we, it can respond at 200 times per second uh, when we're sending those signals. Um, an interesting point about this, uh, this coupling, there's a little bit of production variation from one to the other. How much current is going to give you how much lockup? And to make the system as precise as we want to be, we don't want to deal with that tolerance. So we actually measure uh, the relationship between current input and torque transfer on every single one of these. And you'll see there's a little uh, QR code printed on here. 
and at the end of the line when we build the car, we scan the QR code and feed it back into the computer so it calibrates to its exact components so that it can be as precise as we need it to be. 